Welcome everyone. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm giving the first talk, I guess, today. Uh, thanks for showing up early. And uh, I'm David. Um, I'll be talking about effective infrastructure monitoring um, for Linux with uh, Grafana, I guess, because I'm from Grafana. Uh, and we also use uh, a lot of Prometheus and uh, Loki and Node Exporter. So uh, those things will feature heavily in this, in this talk. And uh, so before we get started, uh, let's do a quick um, sort of catch up on what monitoring looks like at Grafana itself, because we, we also run a couple of servers in a, a couple of clusters. I think right now we have about eight clusters uh, running 270 nodes, I think it was yesterday, and um, for all our hosted metrics and hosted logs, um, SaaS offerings. And uh, we mostly run those on 16 core, 64 gig machines, so quite big things, um, which is quite exciting. And, um, but I'm also curious on uh, if there's sort of overlap with the technology that you folks are using. So maybe just do a quick show of hands. Who here is using Grafana? So yeah, that's, that's quite a bit. Uh, and Prometheus for metrics. Also, yeah, a bit fewer. And uh, anyone starting use Loki already? Yeah, okay, yeah, early adopters. Excellent. And uh, Jaeger, uh, cool, yeah, similarly, um, which will be quite uh, a big thing for us next year, getting a bit better integration for tracing. And uh, monitoring mix-ins, has anyone heard of this and is using this already? No? Oh, okay, yeah, Chris? Oh, you, you heard of them, okay. Okay, that's good, because uh, a lot of uh, content from this talk comes from these, mix, uh, from these mix-ins, but I'll talk about those later. So just another kind of uh, philosophy that we also use at Grafana, that we, we try not to, like, we, we, we make dashboarding software, but we don't want to look at dashboards all day, so we try to just have monitoring by uh, alerting, so using the time series that we produce uh, also to write alerts for, and then uh, only alert us when things are happening, so that uh, most of our infra team can, after work, go off and make uh, shakshuka or whatever, and uh, only have to worry that if something happens, they get an alert on their phone or um, through other means, and uh, only then they have to act. So that's sort of the philosophy around this, and um, uh, some of the alerting uh, rules that I'll show later, they also come from this monitoring mix-in. And um, so talking about monitoring for Linux, uh, for us there isn't really a way around uh, Prometheus and uh, with the help of uh, the node exporter. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to do a quick tour around this. And initially I was looking at the node exporter website or uh, the, the GitHub repo and the readme and it just basically, um, oh, I'm getting select alerts. I should disable this. Um, and um, there's, there's, there's a bunch of collectors in there that um, offer you hardware and OS uh, specific metrics. And because um, this whole thing is written like a pluggable system. And um, for me, this was all a bit kind of a confusing cloud, so to say, of of uh, modules and collectors. So I thought, um, since I'm here in Berlin and uh, Ben from GitLab um, is also based here in Berlin, um, and he happens to be the maintainer from uh, um, of, of the node exporter. So I just met him, I just met up for him um, at the Korean restaurant and uh, just talk about through how we can kind of make a better mental model of what all these different metrics in a node exporter do. And, um, uh, but he, I mean, he'd like to talk, uh, since we're at a, at a Korean restaurant, he just liked to talk about kimchi the whole time and how he made 500 people's worth of kimchi one time. But he had a really good idea, and he uh, remembered this graphic. Who, who has seen this graphic before? Uh, yeah, I guess we're at a Linux user space conference. Uh, that works. And um, so this is a really good map from uh, Brent Gregg. Uh, um, about Linux performance observability tools. And um, Ben has also been using a bunch of these quite, uh, in his in his day-to-day -day job. But uh, the bigger task for him is always how can we also uh, have similar 
uh, information out of uh, or that these tools also provide, how can we have those in a sort of time series? And luckily, there's a bit of overlap with uh, what the node exporter gives you. And for us, then it became a challenge. Okay, how can we map the node exporter metrics to uh, what's uh, sort of available or on what we need to cover in the parts of a Linux system? Um, so we clean up this graphic and uh, then um, try to map uh, the first couple of uh, the first couple of metrics. So if you look at uh, the metrics that a node exporter exports, they always start with node and then underscore, and then um, and then these modules are usually the next term in the metric name. And so we try to do this sort of mapping. And uh, part of this talk now is to go a bit around uh, these different metrics. So the first kind of classic example is uh, CPU utilization. Um, what does CPU utilization even mean? Um, um, people are used to just looking at top, for example, but what, what does that give you? It's a bit unclear. With, um, at, with a time series and the node CPU seconds total, it's a bit more clear what it does, because it gives you the the uh, second spend in uh, wall clock CPU, or in a wall clock time second um, on the CPU in the various modes that um, the CPU supports. So you have system, user, idle, guest, and steal, and all these, um, all these different modes. And so, um, so here, we're, uh, here we're making use of this metric to draw uh, the utilization graph where 100% uh, would be um, nothing running in idle mode, and 100% of, of the CPU being used by um, processes in, uh, in non-idle mode. Yeah. So a uh, similar metric that often comes up uh, for CPU saturation uh, is um, the load average, um, which um, we have just been using traditionally because it's uh, it's just been around for a long time and people have a vague idea on what it means. Uh, it's not really ideal because it's not just a CPU bound um, um, kind of metric because um, it also tracks now a lot of um, uninterrupted task code paths uh, which aren't necessarily um, uh, a reflection of how resource bound your CPU is. So, um, and for this metric, we've which is also not ideal either. We had to always normalize it by the number of um, CPU cores to have kind of a uh, zero to 100% uh, saturation um, scale, basically. Um, so instead of load average, what I hear, what I've heard a couple of times now is to use uh, the pressure stalling indicator, which is, uh, a, I guess, a new um, way of um, monitoring how much pressure there is or how much um, demand there is on the system from a CPU point of view. And um, the difference there is that we're no longer tracking the, just the number of, um, what is it, threads uh, that are waiting for the processor, but we're actually tracking the waiting time. So we're, uh, we'll get a better sense of um, um, how contested that resource is. And as you notice also, we don't really have to divide this anymore by the number of CPUs, because uh, now we're just tracking the overall time that they're waiting. So another, uh, let's just quickly go through uh, memory metrics. Um, we use, um, for, the, for the utilization here, we use the, uh, the fraction of the available to, the, um, to all the available memory and um, subtract this from zero, uh, from one. And that, that gives us the, um, the use space. And um, similarly for saturation, we've decided to use uh, pages swap per second. Um, if anyone has a better metric to um, kind of talk about memory saturation, uh, I'm, I'm also curious on feedback there. And for uh, disk utilization, we're tracking uh, I.O. time. Because uh, so this is how often or how um, uh, how long the disk operations are taking, or how much time was spent in I/O. And um, another uh, interesting thing there is 
uh, that we have a lot of metrics that actually map to things that are given to you by IOSTAT. So there's another sort of the, the space of the overlap there is quite big, actually. And there's an excellent article by Brian Brazel uh, getting into which of the different fields that IOSTAT gives you uh, can be represented by metrics. And so one more thing about disks. Um, I think this is also uh, something that features in every Prometheus training, which is uh, the fear, I guess, of disks uh, getting full. And um, we have some good alerts to, uh, or you can use the Prometheus queries to write uh, some good alerts on how fast, or they will alert you when you're sort of on a trajectory that your disk will become full. And in this example, um, we're using um, that the disk, or that the available disk space should be, um, or this should fire when it's uh, less than 40% less than available. And if the uh, available space is going to be zero, if the trend on how it's filling up over, looked at it over the last six hours, if that's going to be zero in the next 24 hours. And I think this is a quite powerful um, way to express these sorts of constraints. But um, the, and we, uh, um, this condition has to be true for one hour. So there, there's all, as you notice or, already, there's a bit of a drawback there. Um, if the disk now fills up for some higher uh, trajectory uh, in less than an hour, uh, you, you, will, you will have a problem, right? Um, so you need to combine this with uh, other alerts or other uh, alert rules that track more aggressive um, disk filling speeds, I guess. And then uh, you, would, you would tag them with a different severity and then route them to uh, maybe your pager and not just create um, a warning alert. Um, and yeah, so actually a bunch of these are defined in the node mixin, which is um, a JSONnet-based library of um, alerts and recording rules and dashboards. And um, the node mixin for the, um, has a lot of rules for uh, disk running full. So not just, not just, um, oh, let me just do this. Um, not just the disk space running out, but also uh, running out of inodes, that can also happen. So I really recommend uh, taking a look at that um, at that mixin. And even if you don't use JSON it in your um, in your organization, I think it's still good to look at the uh, at the alerting rules. Uh, to be, you can just copy them out. And if you if you think they can be improved, um, you can uh, you can also add uh, um, you can you can open a GitHub issue on that same uh, on that same repo, and then other people can benefit from, uh, from your suggestions. OK, just to round this up, uh, these, are some, uh, these are some network metric, uh, metric queries that we're also running. And um, I always like these, these um, graphs where you can plot the transmitting rates on the negative y-axis. And then you get this sort of nice comparison on how your incoming traffic is shaped versus your outgoing traffic. Okay, so here's something that happened to us recently. Um, this is another metric that's being exposed about contract entries um, that tracks um, how full the contract table is on your system, uh, which is needed to, I guess, take or take care of your of your connections. And we recently had this. Uh, we're running our uh, nodes on GKE, and uh, some of the nodes just um, hit that limit and then couldn't establish any uh, new connections. And so, uh, but this is also something we didn't have an alert for. And this is where I just want to quickly show how you can use Grafana to, to um, write queries that will help you uh, write an alert. So let me check on how this goes. So I'm using the uh, I'm using the Explorer view here, and I'm already 
zoomed uh, zoomed into the time where this actually took uh, where this actually took place. So this was on the 12th and between the 12th and the 13th down here. Uh, oh no, that's the. Uh, Checking, yeah. And then, as you can see here, uh, there was this big spike, and we're hitting we're hitting one, right? So, and the, if you compare the fraction of uh, entries to the limit, and it's one, then uh, the table's full, obviously. So this happened here, and then um, what I then try to do is I use the split view to come come over here and uh, basically start with the same query, and then I start adding these uh, these comparisons. So I only want um, I only want uh, time series, basically, where the connection, oh, where the fraction is bigger than 50%, for example. Then I also use, um, um, I also want to only alert if they're bigger than the average of, um, of all the fractions. And then another good um, practice is to use the standard deviation, uh, like, um, or double the standard deviation uh, from that average so that so that you get um, so that you can rule out a couple of false um, false positives when for example um, everything is sort of at 70 percent for example then maybe that's fine maybe that's GKE is supposed to run but if some of those are um, uh, TBA too much from those uh, these will then show up here right so if we Change this here to, let's say, three, and then run this again. Okay. Then it. Uh, oh, yeah, that's good. It's good. Good point. No, that didn't work. Oh, that worked. Can also zoom in a bit. So now we have fewer. Um, and then, so on this side now, I would be modifying this query. And then when I'm happy with it, um, basically, um, uh, I'm happy when I've identified the offending time series that are on the left. And if they survive on this side, I know I have an alert, alert rule that would have caught this thing. right? And then this is what I would copy out into um, my alerting rule. OK. Let's go back to the talk. So, hmm. Yep. And is that working? Yeah. Okay. And I've lost this window. Um, just whoop, Real quick here. I just have to find my notes. So. There we are. There are the notes. Oh god. This should be easier. And then can I just go left? Yes. Perfect. All right, so a couple of uh, collector gotchas. Um, it's good to be aware uh, how many time series they produce. And uh, when you run a node exporter, uh, it, it also runs, or you can also exit on port uh, 9100 on your system. And then you see the huge list of, uh, of things, um, uh, or the huge list of time series. And uh, sometimes, uh, so this is a bit up to you then to figure out which, uh, which collectors you, you want to enable to uh, not have too many uh, time series. Um, and then also, 
some legacy collectors they uh, they run scripts or execute programs, and then so this puts another puts additional um, burden on your system. Um, for in terms of volume of time series, you could obviously write relabeling rules for uh, to just drop a couple of these, um, but maybe that's a bit uh, too tedious. So I have this pro tip from uh, Richie. Um, who builds data centers in his spare time, and he tends to run two node exporters on each machine, and one with a minimal set and one with a full set, um, so that uh, the stuff that's regularly scraped is, uh, is just contacting the one with the minimal set, and um, if they need to investigate a bit further or look at the, just some, some things that uh, you would otherwise have to log in the machine and uh, look at the proc file system. You can then just go to uh, the second node exporter that has the full set and look at the metrics that are exposed there. And uh, I'm told that there's a lot of savings to be had there. Also, he's a big fan of um, entropy alerting because when you run data centers, some hosts sometimes run out of entropy, which to me always sounds a bit like something from the future. Um, and a uh, little bonus collector, uh, Bjorn, who's also here, uh, told me about this, the, the text file collector. And um, this basically um, adds little text snippets from, um, from files that are in a given directory to the exported metrics um, text that's being parsed by Prometheus. So, and there's some, uh, some nice examples for this, for example. Um, if you have, um, if you have um, maintenance jobs, like running uh, backups or um, um, pushing out new updates over your system, you can track those with um, just writing, it, uh, writing this, this little line, like when the last run was. And then you could, you could also envision an alert that basically checks this timestamp and compares it to uh, the time that's now. And let's say if, it's, um, if your backup hasn't run in like three days, you should probably alert. And then another nice one is if you have, um, if you have a lot of, um, if, you run a, if you run a lot of software directly on the metal, uh, maybe in your whole fleet, you have uh, some features enabled on some, and um, on, on other machines, you have, you have a lot. It's good to have a general overview over, um, over how many parts of your fleet have a certain feature enabled. So a uh, metric like this just helps you track this. Uh, then another fun one is um, uh, tracking how long your SSE disks are going to last. So speaking of rolling out and uh, managing a whole fleet. I'm always a bit jealous when I uh, look at the, uh, the GitLab, um, uh, the GitLab dashboards. Uh, I highly encourage you to look there too. They expose most of their uh, infrastructure monitoring uh, dashboarding uh, on the internet. So you can go to dashboards.gitlab.com and just see how they are doing this. Uh, here in this particular example, they are, they are tracking the kernel version distribution on all their nodes. So here in their production system, they seem to have around 200 nodes. And um, the majority of nodes seems to be running a 410 kernel. Yeah. Which, uh, if we paid attention, um, we'll probably won't have the pressure indicator yet. right? So this is how you can kind of see what sort of capabilities your fleet has. And then they have a really cool one down there, which is the um, um, tracking which, um, um, which hosts are deviating from these majority versions. And, and then you can, which also gave uh, me an idea, um, and I also heard this from Bjorn, that at SoundCloud they had these leaderboards about outdated systems. So you can write queries that uh, basically group by team or by cluster on um, which team has the most out, mo which team is running the most outdated hardware. Um, so these are the 
Let me just click here. Um, see if this works. Yeah, so this is our cluster now. So we do have around 246 nodes, for example, and I'm doing the uh, top K query here. Let's see if we have a couple more. So there's some older ones. Uh, actually, uh, they're running, I guess, similar kernel versions. They're just not very normalized. I guess that's, that's one of the problems with this. Um, but here on the other side, I'm, I'm using uh, a similar query where I'm using uh, the top one, uh, and then I'm uh, counting again, grouping by cluster, so I can see um, which of these are not running. Um, this majority kernel version, basically. And so this is, and then so a similar query you could use in a dashboard to build this sort of leaderboard that, uh, that I showed you. Okay. So, back to this one. Um, so, I guess the bigger, the bigger question is also, how should I organize this, uh, all of this, all of the views uh, in Grafana? And um, here's an example from GitLab again. They do a really nice thing where uh, in their general fleet overview, which includes all their all the hosts um, for, in, in this case, the production system, they do this thing where um, on each row, they have, for example, the CPU utilization, and on the second row, they have the load average, but they have grouped this in columns by the application tier, right? So on the, from the left, you have the web workers, then you have the API, and then you have the Git workers, and this is sort of, in your, in your head, um, how GitLab, I guess, is supposed to work. And um, here you can already see quite uh, easily, I think, on how busy each of these systems is right now. And I think this, I think this is really helpful for capacity planning, for example. And then this is how we do this internally at uh, Grafana. We use the, the mixing again, because that gives us the, the, the dashboards right away as code. And that has uh, a cluster dashboard um, as an aggregation of every node in the cluster. And then also um, a template query driven uh, node dashboard, which basic basically just runs this node exporter query um, and then returns us all the instances, which uh, is our way of service discovery or like node discovery. Because um, Every system that runs a node exporter should expose this thing. Um, and that was it. Uh, oh yeah, we're also hiring. Um, but I'm also really curious if uh, if there's any questions you have about the node mix in, the dashboards, or um, I'm also curious if there's any sort of funny alerting rules that you had to write in the past. So that's it. So uh, I think your arm went up first. So um, the question was, what's the minimum version uh, to be running to uh, have the mix-ins? And the answer for this is probably it should it should already work with five, I think, um, because it uh, because the mix-ins. Uh, is something that, that you run in your build pipeline to output JSON uh, that you then feed into a Grafana instance. And I mean, I, I think if Talk was here, he would he would say like you can go back to version two, right? But uh, I don't I don't know if I uh, if I can make that promise. Yeah, but version five should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Stop! 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 Oh. Thanks, uh, Ed from Packet. Um, did you, you saw, I saw one uh, metric that you'd pulled, which was SSD related um, drive, yeah. drive health. Have you done any, any other bare metal monitoring of note, of like looking at the underlying hardware for the system that you're monitoring? Uh, 
Um, so, uh, so we we at Grafana we don't, but I I would imagine that um, that this is commonly done, and um, if there's any sort of uh, if there's any sort of uh, little tool that can output something to to a text file, then this will be one of the text file collector use cases where you have a, the cron job running and producing this uh, occasionally, and the cron job would r run as root and has access to all these things, and then uh, the uh, the, no the node exporter then exposes it, and Prometheus comes occasionally and reads that value. Okay, so you do yeah. Do a text file exporter, yeah, yeah. So for yeah anything yeah anything that's not directly included as a as a module for um, uh, for node exporter, you can probably easily um, replicate with um, the text file collector. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Oh, it's Casey. Casey Hello. was at the Korean dinner, uh, Korean lunch as well. Yes. Uh, <laughs> do you know of any best practices for ignoring network interfaces that are useless? So if you run containerized workloads, you wind up with a million VETs and bridges and things like that. Uh, so you don't care about, you can't run out of packets or drops on those. Yeah, so we, um, we, uh, we actually have recording rules that ignore, uh, no, uh, yeah, we have recording rules that ignore uh, the loopback interface, for example, so you would, write, you would write a similar recording rule, so it would be ignoring useless something, uh, like that's literally a name that, that we chose for the recording rule, yeah, so maybe not a really satisfying answer, but yeah. <laughs> Yep. Hi. Um, whoop, loud. Um, you create those rules, uh, the alerting rules manually, right? So uh, are there any tools that you could use, like say that, okay, we've had a problem at this time, and these time series uh, show that something is going wrong, and then you would get an automatic alert that will alert uh, later on when the same thing happens again? Yeah. So. Um, there's two parts to this. If it's if it if you can answer this statically, like with like let's say uh, a certain value should never be higher than 70 or something, you can use just uh, Grafana-based alerting, where in the panel you can you can draw a threshold, and then uh, and then that is run in the Grafana backend as a continuous alerting service. Um, if it's more dynamic and uh, sort of the threshold is um, yeah, kind of dependent also on the rest of the traffic, then a Prometheus, uh, a Prometheus, a Prometheus based alert will, would be better. Um, but there's no, currently there's no good interface on how to write these, and uh, I think I've shown you the way, uh, the way I would approach this, uh, just with this sort of split view, where I can see this is all the results, and I only want to filter out the ones that would have alerted, right? And then uh, since, the, since the Prometheus alerting rules are just like queries, where then you just have to uh, also say for how long should this condition be true, uh, then I think it's pretty easily copy and pasteable. Yeah. Thanks. So, oh, just one more, cool. Just one more. Um, you mentioned uh, one component, the PSI, needed a 4.20 kernel. Mm -hmm. Are there any other kernel versions of Node? I know this is a user space Linux conference, so yeah, I don't want to so ask kernel is, questions. Yeah, that's actually what I'm also curious about, and uh, maybe uh, people here uh, actually know the answer. And it's, because that's also a feature that if you looked at earlier at, uh, at our majority version, it's a feature that, that we can't use either, since we're running on GKE, and, and it'll, it might take uh, a good two years, yeah, before this will become available for uh, anything that runs in the cloud, which is a bit sad. But um, yeah, um, cool. I don't see any more questions. Uh, I'm here the rest of the day. Uh, I might pop out real quick to the Brandenburg Gate for the uh, the um, climate strike. Uh, but I'll be I'll be there for uh, for the evening event as well. If you have any questions, cool. Alrighty, thank you.